that every weapon that's formed against us has to be canceled this morning in the name of Jesus. Strategies to take, take our people out canceled right now in the name of Jesus. There's a loosening of promotion in our ranks. It's coming this week in Jesus' name. There's healings taking place this week. If there's anything that's broken this morning, it's about to be fixed and restored better than the way that it was. will be removed. Yokes will be destroyed. Thought patterns that bring you up to a certain level are going to be annihilated this morning. I declare by the blood in the name of Jesus, you're going to think in a higher realm this morning than you ever have. You're going to be able to dream big dreams and write them down. You'll see things happen because your words are powerful this morning. We give you glory and honor and praise for it in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Right now, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Give him the praise that's due his name. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we bless you, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah. We have a God that we can trust. Hallelujah. We trust you, Lord. We trust you, Lord.
us, you go before us. Nothing could stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing could stand against the power of our God. Lost and all alone. 
Hallelujah. We praise God for what he's done. Amen. Hallelujah. So give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. All right, everyone, please be seated this morning. Welcome to Living Wood Christian Church. We're so glad you're here. The house is full. Glory to God. Hallelujah. At this time, we'd like to welcome our first-time guests. If you're visiting here for the first time, we would like to welcome you with a living wood welcome. So if you can show by a raise of hand, one of our ushers, we have a packet we would like to give to you and welcome you here. Oh, praise God. Awesome. Welcome to Living Wood Christian Church. You just received a packet from one of our ushers, and in that packet there is some information about our church. We just ask kindly if you can please fill out the card in there, and um, you can either put it in the offering bucket as it comes by, or after the service we have a, a team of people who would love to meet you and greet you warmly. Uh, just ask anyone as you exit through the door, our visitors' um, room or hospitality area is there that we can welcome you and shake your hand. and you know, just greet you warmly. Amen? So thank you for joining us. And if you're online and visiting us for the first time, welcome to Living Word as well. As you can see, Pastor is not here today. He's a little bit under the weather, so he decided to stay home and just recover a little bit so he can be all set for this week and the next Sunday. But we're here with Pastor Mike Keys. So... Looking forward to an awesome service with Pastor Mike today. 
Okay, we just have a few announcements we'd like to share with you just to remind you this coming Tuesday, April 9th, we'll continue with our women's Bible study right here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. We had a great time on Tuesday, so come on out and join us. Uh, we would love to have you with us. Amen? And our women's meeting this Saturday, amen, for Minister with Minister Phyllis Carr. That's this coming Saturday right here in the sanctuary at 10 a.m. So come out and join us. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor. Just invite someone. Women, let's, let's rally together. And, you know, we'll put the men to, uh, I'll leave the guys to fill it out, right? All right. So men's meeting coming up the following Saturday, April 20th. Okay, men, this is your chance. With Pastor Ray, again, here in the sanctuary at 10 a.m., and uh, please sign up for all these events. It will really help us as we prepare for each event. Uh, you can sign up using, using the QR code, email, or text message. Amen. So that's it for today, and I'd like to welcome Elder Jerry to receive the offering. I'm anointed this morning to receive your tithes, offerings, building fund, and radio ministry offering this morning. It's on, right? You can hear me okay? Good. <laughs> okay. Grace, go ahead and put that scripture up for me, please, would you? Is it up? Oh, good, okay. Um, this scripture, set of scriptures right here will work today. It's worked for businessmen to produce Fortune 500 companies. So whatever anybody's ever told you that this thing is dead, this thing is live. And if you'll suck the spiritual nutrients out of this scripture, it'll put you in a different financial realm where you'll never have to borrow money and you'll be debt free for the rest of your life. Now, pay attention to where it says, Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Do his business, and he'll take care of your business right there. Okay? And prove me. Prove me now. Now's an interesting word. It updates itself every time you say it. Prove me now will work when you have a financial catastrophe during the week and your finances are down to a low. Prove me now will make it happen for you. If you do this and you put this in your mind and you meditate it on, the, not just when we come here to receive it, you should start tithing. The, you should write a tithe. Take Deuteronomy chapter 26 as your outline and fill it in with who you are. And before you get here, start speaking it and saying it. This word is true. It doesn't matter that it's in the Old Testament. He references tithers in the New Testament. Read Hebrews 7. Read Matthew 6. Read it all. He's, he's behind and backs tithers. You have tithers' rights. Now, how many of you had a chance to witness to anybody this week? Very few. But how many of you gave to the radio ministry? When you give to the radio ministry, every soul that, that is brought in goes to your account. You help Pastor Ray with the radio ministry. You're actually building your reward in heaven because you're winning souls to the kingdom by using the radio ministry to win souls. It goes to your account. How many got a mortgage? We have totally collected $356,888.35. That's good. Now, the breakthroughs, the mortgages being paid off is going to be in the other $700,000 that we collect to get to a million. How many is going to sign up and do that? How many want to get rid of your mortgages and put a demand on the Holy Ghost to pay your mortgages off so you can truly be debt-free? Debt-free is a good thing. And then teach your kids how to buy houses with cash, with the, with the blessing of the Lord that's on your life. Teach your kids how to buy automobiles with cash, with money, uh, with money and, and get out of the world system so that you can be free to work for him. 
You know, you're going, to, you're going to a job tomorrow, and you probably bought the best clothes you could wear to get there to impress the boss and do everything. But I'm going to tell you, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, will work faster and harder for you than that will. If you put your eyes on that, if you're not a tither, I'm telling you, it's going to be an uphill struggle for you. But if you tithe and do this, read the blessings that are because of the tithe. Go ahead, scroll up a little bit. Verse 12 says, how many of you got a personality problem where they just don't like you? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 12 says he's going to make you a delightsome land. It comes from the Hebrew word charisma, which means he's going to put a charisma on you. They're going to fall in love with you. They're going to love you no matter who you are, what you are. That's what he says. That's the promises. He says he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. How many of you getting flat tires because of the beautiful roads we have? He says he'll take care of that for you. Anything that's going to affect you anyway, he says he will do that for you. If you will believe him, if you'll trust him, if you'll meditate on his word, he'll take care of you. Now, we got an awesome building. We have an awesome opportunity with the building fund. We have an opportunity to get you out of any stranglehold the devil has on you with that whatever. If you believe God when you're sowing into that building fund and your seed is to pay that mortgage off, to get loose from credit cards, debt, use it. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So seek him for that and go for it in Jesus' name. Now stand with me. Let's, let's pray over this and let's believe God for the best to do financial miracles in our house today. All right? Father, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Jesus, you're the high priest of our offering. Worship God the Father with it right now, I pray, Lord. And Father, your word said to call ourselves blessed because we're, we're, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we call ourselves blessed, and we call ourselves, Father, that we have everything we need to fund every dream and vision that you're giving to us, and we do not have to rely on the worldly system for it. Our trust is in you. We know you'll use that system, but our trust is in you, and we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for it because you truly are the King of kings and the Lord of of lords in jesus name we pray amen Possible. 
would you would you help me welcome Apostle Pastor Michael Keyes to the pulpit? Come on, give him give him a royal hand in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you, Jesus. How many love Jesus? Yeah. Me too. Thank you, Father. Don't sit down yet. Thank you. Father, we thank you for an opportunity today to gather together around your word. We thank you for freedom in America. To gather together anytime we want to do this, to worship you freely. We thank you for freedom. And for all the men and women around in the armed forces that have bled and died to protect that freedom for us. We thank you for them. We thank you for them. Thank you, Father. As we approach your word today, Lord, we do so with reverence and respect. And we thank you that your word is a living thing. It is sharper than any two-edged sword and will pierce to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of our hearts. So we believe, Lord, that we'll see something today, we'll learn something today, and we'll leave the service stronger than when we came in here, and better equipped to represent you with excellence wherever you may send us in these last days. So we thank you, Lord, again. Everything we do, we do because of you. We give you the praise and the glory, and we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed our soon-coming king. We give you the praise and the glory for these things. Everybody that agrees with that said together. Yeah. All right, back up and park. Thank you, Jesus. Of course, we're very sorry that Pastor Ray was not able to join us this morning because he's still taking his healing in Jesus' name. So he's in the process of mending. Praise God. So we know that he's with us in spirit and through the online ministry of Living Word. It's always a joy for my wife and I to join you and be with you for these services. In case you don't know who she is, Ethel, would you please stand so everybody can see who you are? Thank you, Lord. Now that's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, thank you again for your prayers and for your support for this ministry. Uh, we have a work overseas since 1980. We have a church network of between 275 and 300 churches. We have a crusade ministry that from 1980 until now, 44 years of work, we have led more than 750,000 people to Jesus. Amen. And then we, yeah, give him the glory. Praise the Lord. He's worthy. Amen. And we have a Rhema Bible Training College as well. So we're teaching and training. We're replicating our vision for people all around the Philippines and in Southeast Asia to preach and to share the word of God. And we also, as of last November, now pastor a church in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, yippee ki praise the Lord. I left my horse at home. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway, I'm excited today. Um, I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 13. I'm sorry, chapter 30, excuse me, chapter 30. Verse number 19. I want to look at a verse with you here today. And uh, it's a verse we need to be reminded about. Okay, and we're going to talk about three words today, three very important words from the Word of God that I hope that you'll listen to and receive and learn from and how they apply in your life, wherever you are sent by the Lord to represent Him. But beginning in Deuteronomy number 30, chapter number 30 and verse number 19, God says this, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose. Everyone say choose. choose. Okay, it's not up to God. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Amen. The greatest weapon that God has given us is free will. Yes. The power of choice is the greatest weapon you have been given by God. God will not force you to accept him, and Satan can't stop you when you choose to do so. Amen. All right? God would love everybody. The Bible says he's not willing that anybody perish, 
but that all will come to repentance and spend eternity with him. On the other side of that coin, the devil hates everybody and wants to see everybody damned and sent to hell forever and ever. That would make, that would make him as happy as he could possibly be if there's even such a thing for him. But it's all up to us. It's all up to you. It's all up to you and your life. I can't choose for you, and you can't choose for me. I made my choice a long time ago. I told my Lord, I will be there at the finish line. I'm not going to fall away. I'm not going to quit. I'm not a perfect person. I've made mistakes, and so have you. But thank God there's blood on a mercy seat. It's not a judgment seat. It's a mercy seat. Every morning, the Bible says his mercy is new because we need it every morning. Praise the Lord. So, we get to choose the life we live. You get to choose the life you live. You know, Elder, uh, you know, Jerry talked about, you know, choosing to tithe. You know, that's a choice, okay? You don't have to. God's not going to make you do these things. But he promises these wonderful things if we make these choices and if we choose to follow him and if we choose to separate ourselves to him and if we choose to make ourselves available to him, then all kinds of good things happen to us and come our way. Praise the Lord. I want you to write these three words down if you're taking notes or if you have a tablet where you can do that. If not, remember for later, I'll quiz you at the end of the service. The, three, the big three E's. All these words, these three start with the letter E. From the English language, of course. Entrusted. Enlisted. Entangled. Three words. Amen. Entrusted. Enlisted, entangled. We'll talk about what these mean to us here this morning, okay? I want you to go with me to 1 Thessalonians. Let's go over to the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. And verse 1. We'll read a few verses. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, and the first verse. Here's what it says. And I'm reading from the New King James translation, if otherwise, unless otherwise indicated. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Verse 2. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Verse 3. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. And then verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted, there's the first word, entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who will test our hearts. All right, I want you to notice, first of all, the context of verse 4. These people were being persecuted. He says, we suffered before. We were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know. But even so, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Not just a little bit, but a lot of conflict. Everywhere he went, the devil tried to shut this man down because he knew that this man knew the mystery of Christ, which is the New Testament message, that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for Jews, he died for everybody. Amen. The Jews didn't know this until Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. They all still thought that you had to be a Jew to be saved, even after the crucifixion and the resurrection. It took that meeting with Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 to open their eyes to the fact, my God, he died for everybody, not just for us. Paul was the one that had this revelation, and he was sent into the world. That's why the devil did everything he could think of to kill this man and get him off the planet, because that message is the one we have embraced and why we're here today. So he's in much conflict. He suffered before. He, he, the implication is he's continuing to suffer. But it says in verse 4, even so, we have been, we have been, we have been approved by God, to do what? To be entrusted, entrusted with the one message on the planet that saves souls, the gospel, the gospel, the word of God, the good news that your sins, we sang about it a few minutes ago, our sins are forgiven, we're on our way to heaven. You know, put a smile on your face. 
because no matter what kind of hell you may be going through at the moment, we are still one day closer to seeing Jesus. With every tick of the clock, with every hour that passes, with every day you cross off on the calendar, we're one day closer to going home. Amen. If we, you know, if we don't make it through the rapture, if that is held off until we die physically, we die, we leave our body behind, we go on home to be with Jesus. If the rapture takes place in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are out of here. Praise the Lord. And praise God, we get a new body. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. I'm going to get my hair back. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You know, I practice. I practice in the mirror. What's happening? Hey, hey, how y'all doing? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's the spirit of Mustang. That's upon me, praise the Lord. In fact, when I get to heaven, you won't even recognize me. I'll have to have a name tag. This is old brother Mike. No, that's not you. Just a minute. Oh, yeah, it's really you. That's right, that's right. For all of you old enough to remember the TV series, The Addams Family, how many remember Cousin It? And that's what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so, look at those words, even so, even so we're spitefully treated, even though we're in much conflict, even though we're getting shot at by the devil, even though it's all coming down around us, even so, even if. We continue to speak the gospel without apology, without hesitation. Well, someone may not like it. I guarantee there'll be people who don't like it. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You know, we've been lied at, shot at. They've had knives. You know, people have jumped up on the stage while I'm preaching trying to stab me with a big pen. Really. They took the cartridge out and used the, the uh, plastic uh, holder, whatever, and filed it down so that it was a point like this. He comes at me with the big pen. So we backed him off the stage in the name of Jesus. Amen. Actually fell off the stage backwards. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And everybody that was standing around saying, I'm not sure who this American is, but I want what he's got. Praise the Lord. So they all got saved. Entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you like me, if I like you. You know, I'm not commanded to like you. You're not commanded to like me, but we are commanded to love each other. And that's a whole different animal. Okay? Praise the Lord. The one single most powerful message on the planet that actually changes a person's destiny from heaven, from hell to heaven, forever and forever, is the one message we have been entrusted with. It's an amazing thing to me that in spite of all of our problems, issues, idiosyncrasies, all of this stuff, he has entrusted us yes. with the one message. When you heard it, your life was turned around. You gave your life to Jesus. Somebody told you about this. Yes. Somebody sat down with you at Starbucks or at work or wherever and talked with you or you found about it on the internet or in a church service. Somebody said something that you responded to to turn your life around, and so when you die, you don't go down forever, you go up forever, because someone shared that one message that God has entrusted us with. Amen. You know, in the, book of Reve in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, angels will fly through the sky preaching, but they can't do it now. It's you and me. You're qualified. Notice, we have been approved by God. God approved you. On the day you accepted Jesus, you were approved. You can be used. Well, I'm just somebody. Who cares? God knows where you are, and God knows what you can do for him. You don't have to go to somebody's Bible school to get, a, get educated, get qualified. You're qualified. If you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, you're qualified. Just speak it. He'll take it from there. Just speak it. He'll take it from there. You're not the Savior. He is. But he waits for you to deliver the message. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Someone, if you, if you ought to hear it, someone's got to share it with you. Someone's got to share it with you. And you and I, we have been entrusted with it. So we cannot allow ourselves to become entangled. Someone say amen. amen. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy. 
Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. Here's what it says. This is Paul talking to his protege, his son in the faith, Timothy. Here's what he says. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, verse 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare. What's the next word? Entangles himself. I want you to notice the devil didn't do it. You did it to yourself. I do it to myself. You can't blame the devil. He's He's alongside to assist. But our free choice is what he's after. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him. There's the third word. Enlisted him as a soldier. Do you understand that when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of your life, you were enlisted? You became a soldier in the army of the Lord. He just said so in verse 3. That's how God sees you, a soldier in the army of the Lord. We are a world at war and the souls of men are the targets. God loves them all, wants us all to be in heaven with him. Satan hates us all and wants us all to burn in hell with him. That's the reality of the life in which we live. And it's just frankly amazing to me that many Christians, I'd say even the majority of Christians, don't see the forest for the trees. They live their life, they go to work, they come home, they pay their bills, they go to church, they sing a few songs, put some money in the bucket, and disappear from Monday until Saturday. And then repeat the process the following Sunday, the following month, the following year, until they die and go on home. What a tragedy. There's such potential in each one of us here today. You can lead somebody to the Lord who might possibly go somewhere else and win tens of thousands of people. How would you know? You don't know. I tell people, you know, if God tells you to go down to Taco Bell tomorrow at lunch with a track in your hand and wait for further instructions, do what you're told to do. And you'll sit there, you know, with your track. And someone walks in, God says, there they are. Give them the track and then you can go. Okay, hand them the track. They look at you, ah, you Christians. You Christians, a bunch of hypocrites. I hate church, I hate Jesus, I hate you tears the track up, throws it on the ground, curses you, flips you off, orders his food while you go out the door thinking, what was that all about? What a waste of time. You're in your car driving home wondering what in the world happened here. Unknown to you, after, you know, stupid orders his taco and leaves, here comes Ernie Enchilada. He comes in. He sees the track on the ground. He picks it up, puts it back together, reads it sits there and gets saved. You don't even know what's happened. You're on your way home mumbling to God. He gets saved, turned on to God, goes to Bible school, gets born again, spirit-filled, gets sent to Africa, wins sent tens of thousands of people on ball fields around the world, and then when, they, when you stand before the Lord someday, you not knowing any of this, multitudes of people walk up to you and say, thank God for you. You'll say, for what? I don't even know you. This is how it works. And they will say, no, we never met down on planet Earth, but you went to Taco Bell with that track because God told you to, and you gave it to the man that tore it up. But I, you know, we're here today because the man that picked it up and got saved, went to Bible school, became a minister of the gospel, went to my home country in Nairobi or wherever, Kenya, etc., and had a crusade, and I got saved, and I got my whole family together. Here they are now, and they got their grandchildren. There they are now, and this is all because of you and your track. That's what I'm telling people. You don't have to go off to XYZ Bible school to be used by God. Just do what you can do. If you do what you can do, he'll do what you can't. And you're sowing seeds. You're sowing seeds. And the real reward is in heaven. 
The real reward is in heaven where you get your rewards and no thief can take it. Raw, uh, rust can't corrode it. They can't, you're going to have it forever. Do you know there's five crowns listed in the New Testament? Your dwelling place in the New Jerusalem will have a crown closet. Five shelves. There are five crowns promised to believers in the New Testament. I expect to wear mine with pride because of who my Jesus is. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Nobody engaged in warfare. You are engaged in the warfare. Even if you don't know that you are, you are. I tell people, would you wake up and smell the bacon? Because Satan knows who you are, and he will take you out. The Bible says, you know, ignorance, God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. You are somebody to be reckoned with. You have the Holy Ghost. You've got the Word of God. Don't be afraid of the devil. The devil's afraid of you. Tell him to get out of your house. Tell him to get out of your marriage. Tell him to get out of your business. He's got no business being there. Get out. Take your lies somewhere else. You can't sow that stuff here. I know who I am and I know who you are. And raise your voice when you do it. Let your neighbors hear you. They need to hear you. Amen. When I was at uh, Bible school, I, I lived in a little rundown old shack of an apartment complex in 7A. It was a two-story deal, like a U con configuration with a little courtyard in the middle. I was in 7A by myself. This was before I met my wife. This is in, in uh, Tulsa, 1979, going to Bible school there. And, uh, you know, uh, up above me was an elderly couple. <laughs> I'm jo joking to myself now. I'm an elderly couple today, you know. But <laughs> back then it was those guys. And I'm, you know, 26, 27, whatever it was, and uh, they're upstairs. And we never met all year when I was at school, nine months. But there was a parking lot outside of this little configuration, this U-shaped thing, and you had to pass through a breezeway from the inner court to the parking lot to get to your car. So here I am, two weeks before I leave for the Philippines in September of 1980. Been there since September of 1979. Okay, 12 months, nine months in school and a couple of months to sell all my stuff and get ready to leave for the Philippines. And so I'm coming out. Now I knew that this elderly couple was upstairs because I'd see them from time to time. I knew who they were and where they were up above me in 7B. And so I'm walking out through the breezeway, kind of like this. It's a hallway with walls here and a ceiling and I'm walking out to my car and they're coming in. So we meet in the, in the breezeway, first time in all these many months, nine months, 12 months, whatever. And so, you know, you, you exchange pleasantries, you know, you meet and say, hi, how are you, nice day, and said, et cetera. So we're doing that. And I'm about to introduce myself, you know, and, and the, the lady says, very sweet, she says, oh, young man, we know who you are. I said, what do you, oh, no, she says, oh, we know, uh, you're the preacher, aren't you? I said, what do you mean I'm the preacher? She says, you're you're the preacher, right, in 7A. I said, yeah, okay. But how did you know I'm a preacher? I mean, we haven't talked. We've never met until just this moment. And she says with her husband, she says, oh, young man, we listened to your sermon through the floor. <laughs> I said, what? She said, yeah, you shout so loud, we don't need to go to church. We just sit there and take notes <laughs> in our living room. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Nobody engaged in warfare entangles himself, entangles himself, entangles himself. Don't blame the devil. All he can do is make suggestions. But you're the one that buys into it or not. With what? The affairs of this life. The affair, what are the affairs of this life? Everything. You know, cooking, cleaning, shopping, going to work, going to school, you know, minding the children. You know, taking care of the yard work, cutting the grass, washing the car, you name it. That's the affairs of this life. Everybody understand? Do you understand we're on the clock? This is a time-bound dimension. 24 hours is given to everybody each day. I don't have 26 and you've got 22. You know, Filipinos don't have 28 and uh, Japanese have 25. Everybody on the planet has 24 hours to work with. Okay? Now here's the deal. If you're called to be a soldier in the army of the Lord, you need to be strong to make it to the finish line. Because I'll tell you, in 44 years of serving the Lord, I've seen them come and I've seen them go. 
I've seen them on the cover of Charisma magazine, and I've seen them disappear and implode from the inside out. I've seen the churches rise, and I've seen them fall. But I'm telling you that I've made my choice, and I'm going to make it to the finish line in the name of Jesus. And that's the decision you have to make. But you don't just make that because you love the Lord. You make it because you're strong enough to slap the devil around consistently until you make it to the finish line. Amen. Every Christian should be issued a slapper, a slap a meter, you know. It's all in the wrist. You just got to practice. Thank you, Jesus. Don't become entangled with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him. There it is. You were enlisted. You got saved. You were drafted. You were drafted into God's military. That's you. Male or female, it doesn't make any difference. We're all in this together. And we're supposed to help each other. Amen? Look with me, if you would, at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, chapter 1, verse number, let me see here, um, 6, Joshua 1, 6. We'll read a few verses here. This is Joshua getting marching instructions from God because Moses has just died, so the mantle of leadership has passed from Moses to Joshua. He is now responsible for leading a nation of 2 million plus people. Okay, so God's talking to him about how you're going to do this successfully. So he says in verse number 6, actually verse 5, we'll start there. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong, in the, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to it from the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then, everyone say, then. then. Okay, it's, it, this is a qualifier. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Anybody here want to be prosperous and successful? Anybody here want to be poor and broke? Hmm, no hands. Amazing. Well, how come people are broke and confused and lost and stumbling around? Because they don't do what God said to do right here. That's why. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. Then you'll be prosperous. Then you'll be successful. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? That's a rhetorical question. Yes, you have. I know that you have. What's the command? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You are never, ever alone ever. He's always there. Always. He just said so. And Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said it too. Okay. I want you to notice the words strong and courageous are listed three times in those verses. And in fact, if you read the 18th verse, it's a fourth time. And in verse nine, it's in command form. He's commanding us to be strong. Okay. I went to the Lord, you know, in my, in my military days and also in my corporate days, I learned, I was taught to uh, ask for definition of terms because if you don't know what they're talking about, stop the lecture and ask for a definition for the terms being used because assumptions kill people. And so uh, I'm, I'm being commanded to be strong. So I asked the Lord, okay, how do you define strength? Not how I define it, not how you, we define it, but how do you define it? Because I'll stand before your judgment seat, not anyone else's. First of all, you know, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Amen. Joy is not happiness. Even sinners are happy. They're happy right up to the day they die and go to hell. They can be very happy. Okay, but joy comes from the inside. That comes from the presence of the Holy Ghost. 
Sinners cannot be joyful. They can be happy, but they can't be joyful. That is a fruit of the Spirit. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And I'm not talking about running around like, you know, like with a coat hanging in your mouth, some kind of spear-filled hyena, you know, laughing at everything. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is this inner conviction that God is with me. He'll never leave me. That where I'm going, something's going to happen for Jesus. That's joy. That's one definition. But then the Lord said something to me. He said, strength can also be defined as consistency of your actions. I said, what? Strength can also be defined as consistency of your actions. I said, what does that mean? He said, each and every day, you have spiritual priorities to perform and carry out. Most Christians don't know what they are, so they don't even bother. They can't because they don't know. He gave me a list. In fact, the list was in, given in 1984, and I've held on to it ever since, and it's taken me where I've gone all over the world. We've been shot at. We've dug bullets out of the wall in our house. We've been shot at. I'm going to make it to the finish line. No devil's going to take me out in Jesus' name because I've learned a few things, and these are the things you can apply to. Seven priorities of life is what he called them. Seven. In descending order of importance, one more important than two, which is more important than three. They're all important, but in relation to each other, we start with one. Number one, worship. Every day, every day, worship. Number two, praise. By the way, worship and praise are different. You worship for who he is. You praise him for what he does. We sang about it a few minutes ago. Number one, worship. Number two, praise. Number three, prayer. Prayer. Learn how to pray effectively. Effectively. A lot of people pray, but they don't pray effectively. Anyway, that's some, for some other time. Number four, confession. Confess the word. Speak it. Say it. Listen to yourself. Faith comes by hearing. The best person to use for this is you. Confession. Number five, meditation. Take a verse and meditate on it. Look at it. Think about it. Let the Holy Spirit expand it to you. Get into the Greek. Find out what it means in a deeper uh, you know, realm of explanation from the Greek or from the Hebrew. That's meditation. Number six, study and reading. When you read your Bible, study when you read. Don't just read it. Study it. And number seven, sharing. Take what you've learned and share it with somebody else. But you can't do sharing until you've done one through six. Because un until you do one through six, you've got nothing to share. Just a lot of hot air that annoys people. Don't let that happen. Okay? Worship, praise, prayer, confession, meditation, study and reading, and sharing. Seven priorities done every single day. It's not doing it, it's doing it consistently. The consistency of your actions. Everybody prays. Everybody worships. Everybody does these things, but they don't do it consistently. They do it inconsistently. Most Christians are consistently inconsistent. Okay, they do it, but they don't do it on a regular basis. So they're not building within themselves a platform and a foundation of strength that can withstand unexpected tragedies, unexpected challenges. You go to the doctor because you have a headache and the doctor finds a brain tumor. I've met people that have had these things happen to them. Okay, Unexpected tragedies. A thunderstorm comes through and a hailstorm takes down a tree and it takes down your roof and you got no house unexpected things you didn't wake up planning for. How many know the devil does not, does not send you Facebook posts <laughs> letting you know that he's coming with hemorrhoids next week? <laughs> he's not going to send you a text or a tweet telling you he's coming down the road. Okay, it's a surprise attack. He tries to overwhelm you with what you weren't expecting. The consistent Christian is never off guard. They are with weapons in hand, standing their post, ready, willing, and able to defend themselves, defend their marriage, defend their family, defend whatever, because they, they're ready. Because I've spent time in the Word. I've spent time depositing it. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The key word in that statement is abundance. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I want to know if you're spending time with the Lord, all I do is if I, all I have to do is follow you around for a couple days and listen to what comes out your mouth. Amen. I'll know. Amen. You won't have to tell me. I'll know by what's coming out your mouth. Amen. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. 
But when, you know, you go into the doctor's office and they lay something on you that you weren't expecting and they say to you, you got, you got six months to live or, you know, you blah, 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 like that. Thank you. Thank you for doing all you can. But here's my deal. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. <laughs> Himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. Nothing is impossible to him who believes. And I believe that I'm walking out of here and I'm healed in the name of Jesus. That's what you say to him or her. Thank you, Jesus. We are commanded to be strong. That means we're commanded to be consistent with your prayer time, consistent with your worship. Start each day on your knees. Spend time worshiping the Lord. You've got another day to serve him. Thank God. There's people in hospitals that wish they could come out of there. You're not in the hospital. Thank God you're not there. All right. Thank God you weren't born in some Muslim country where it's against the law to read your Bible. In this country, we can do that here. We can talk to people about Jesus. Freedom is not, well, freedom is not free. A bunch of people have died and bled so that we have it and keep it. And thank God for these people. All right? Praise the Lord. All right. Going back to 2 Timothy, we'll wrap this up. Is this helping anybody? Good. It's helping me. I write these books, and many times God says, you need to go back and read your own book, stupid. <laughs> okay. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So I went to the Lord, again, asking for definition of terms. I've been trained to do this. And I said, okay, you've defined for me strength, consistency of my actions. Now, what about entanglements? How do you define that? So he said to me, he said, entanglements is anything that prevents you from fulfilling your seven priorities every day. It doesn't have to be sin. Hebrews talks about weights and sins. Okay? Sins are obvious acts of rebellion against God. We know what a sin is. And Jesus told me, he said, most Christians that are serious about serving me, they don't really have a problem with sin because they know what it is and they do their best to stay free from it. It's the weights. It's the weights, he said. That's what brings us down, the weights. And I said to the Lord, define for me what a weight is. He said, a weight is simply a time stealer. It steals your time. Okay? I'll give you an example. Um, sports. Nothing wrong with sports. Basketball, football, baseball, whatever, okay? Nothing wrong with any of that. Those are sports. But if you allow those things to take the time away from you for your prayer time because you're watching the big game or you, you're not in church on Sunday because the schedule uh, is such that my team is playing today, and, you know, when you start making those kind of decisions, that sport, whatever it is for you, becomes an entanglement to you. It might not be an entanglement to someone else, but it is to you because it's preventing you from doing what you need to do to stay strong for Jesus. You know, we, we go to churches in places like Las Vegas, Reno, Nevada, and they put us in hotels many times that and at the base of the hotel are, are casinos. Okay, you got to walk through the casino to get to your room and walk through the casino to leave the hotel to go to a meeting. I have to admit, I like the twinkling lights. <laughs> I do like the lights, it, twinkling, whatever. And all the ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I, I like that stuff. But you see these people sitting there at that sheet, uh, that thing. I go, to, I go to the service at 10 a.m. I come back from service at 2 p.m. after service and lunch, and they're still sitting there. <laughs> Many of these people are born again. What's happened to these people? Gambling has become a weight to them. I mean, I could go through those casinos all day long for a thousand years. I'm not interested. I could care less. But for some people, that's the weight. Other people, it's smoking. Other people, it's drugs. Other people, it's pornography. Other people, it's whatever it is that keeps you from worship, praise, prayer, confession, meditation, study, reading, sharing your gospel, and, and telling everybody about Jesus. When you get entangled like that, you can't blame the devil. You entangled yourself. And then when something doesn't happen in your life, don't blame God. Don't say this is your fault. No, it's not your fault, God. I was the one that made these decisions. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. 
How many were glad they came today? Yeah, praise the Lord. Okay. God knows you have to do the affairs of this life. He knows you have to cook, clean, shop, take care of the kids. He knows that. The point is it all takes time. So manage the clock. Every day you got 24 hours. You got to sleep because we live in a body that requires sleep. That's eight hours average out of 24. You're down to 16. In the Philippines, then they add on to that two hours of siesta. I tell my pastor, you know, if you people were as faithful to God as you are to your bed every afternoon at 1 p.m., we'd be, you know, spiritual juggernauts here. So for them, it's like add another two, okay, 16 down to 14, okay? Then you got to go to the market and buy your food. Then you got to bring it home and cook it. Then you got to do this, and then you got to do this, and then you got homework with the kids. Bottom line, the time element, you're losing time because it takes time to pray. It takes time to study the Bible takes time to worship, the, does it not? Yes. Yeah, and the more you do that, good for you, but all that time, the clock is running, okay? Be a good manager of your time. Secular or spiritual, it doesn't matter. Time management is paramount to success in Christ. You better learn to manage the clock because in the spirit world, there is no time. Satan does not have a clock on the walls of hell, and God doesn't wear a Seiko or a Rolex on his wrist. There is no time in heaven, but our enemies, even though they are not bound by time, we are. Because until we step out of this body and go home, we're bound by time. We have weeks and days and months and years. Okay? We're spirits living in bodies. I, you can't see me. I'm inside of this. This is my earth suit. I can't see you. When your body dies, you don't die. Amen. You go home. If Jesus is Lord, you go up. If Jesus is not your Lord, you go down. Whichever way you go, you're going forever. <laughs> forever. Baby cakes, there is no parole board hearings in hell. You're gone. So I tell people, to be entrusted with the gospel, what an honor. It is the greatest honor and simultaneously the greatest responsibility a Christian can ever have. Amen. To let God entrust us and approve us to share a message that when people listen to it, they accept it, they accept the Lord Jesus Christ, they turn their life around, they become a born-again creation just like you and just like me. The greatest miracle on the planet is the new birth. Yes. Amen. Someday soon, like I said earlier, we're going to get a new body to go with it. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. It's, in it's interesting. Jesus invented time. Think about it. He invented time. When he created the world, he invented the time that, that governs it. Okay? But we're operating on an eternal clock, so to speak, because with God, all things are possible. Yes. Nothing's impossible for him. Amen? Amen? How many believe that? Nothing's impossible for him who believes. Amen. Okay? Well, then, you know, notify your face in the morning. <laughs> I've met some Christians like, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'm just shuffling through. Glory to God. Well, thank you. I won't follow you anywhere. <laughs> what a depressing witness that is, you know. <laughs> I want someone to say, you know what? I want what you've got. You, well, I don't know what it is, but it, it, I like it. Yeah. Everybody who comes through those doors should sense the presence of God in here. They should say, you know what, this is nice. I like this. I can't sing very well, but everybody else can. I'll just kind of hum along, praise the Lord, because I like it here. They, can't, they don't know what's going on, but it's the presence of the Holy Ghost. It's the magnet that's pulling their spirit. Amen. And if they're exposed to it, sooner or later, if they're smart, they'll accept Jesus. Amen. And all of that's on us, brothers and sisters. All of that's on you and me. Amen. So please, do yourself a favor. Don't buy into all the carnal, secular distractions all around us that get us off target, off, you know, get us out of our lane. Amen? I'll tell you for a fact, and I tell this everywhere I go, racism is of the devil. You know why? This is really very simple. God loves everybody. Satan hates everybody. There you go. So what's that tell you about what's going on down here? 
God loves everybody. I tell my pastors, he doesn't care what color your skin is, what level of education, what culture, what nationality, what kind of passport you've got. If you live and breathe, he loves you. He died for you. He died for you. Nobody is more important than anybody else. Nobody is more important than anybody else. We are all equal in the eyes of God. He loves everybody. There's no class structure here. And the devil hates everybody. He doesn't care where you came from, what nationality, what color of skin. He hates you. Because you're breathing, he hates you. That's the message people need to hear. Because all of the other stuff is distraction. Gets us off into all these little rabbit trails that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Amen? No PhDs in heaven. No, no professors, none of that stuff. We're all equal in the eyes of God. Equal, equal, equal. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. That's the message the world needs to hear. Amen. We're all equal. God loves everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, we thank you for our service today. We believe, Lord God, that the word that we've shared from Scripture will penetrate our hearts. And we will never forget these three words, Lord. We've been entrusted. We have been enlisted in your army as soldiers, and we will not allow ourselves to be entangled with the affairs of this life. No more. It's okay, Lord, to follow our team. It's okay to be into it to a certain degree. It's okay to get into hobbies and all kinds of things, Lord, but help us to remember all of that stuff is left behind when we die. It's all left behind. And the only thing we carry with us to heaven is the record of our lives and the words we've spoken and the people we have led to the Lord. That's all that matters. There's nothing else that counts ever, not for eternity. I asked the Lord one time, because the Bible says in, in Proverbs 27, 21, a man is valued by what other people say of him. I, I read that for a long time, and I wondered, what does that mean? A man is valued by what other people say about him, not what God says. Because I just said, and God declares it, he loves everybody the same. So the Lord helped me. He said, listen, I love everybody. Okay, if you're listening, you're watching online, you are loved by God. You are loved by him unconditionally. He died for you no matter who you are or where you are, and including anybody in this building right now. But he said, the value of your life is not determined by me. It's determined by you. I said, what does that mean? He said, when you stand before me on judgment day, the judgment seat of Christ, which the Bible says we will all stand before him, your spouse won't stand with you. Your pastor won't stand with you. You'll stand alone. Your life will be judged with the words you've spoken and the decisions you've made after accepting Jesus. Beforehand, all that's washed away by the blood of Jesus. There's no history there. But after you accept Jesus, your life will be judged. And there'll be works, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up. And what's left over will equal your reward. Whatever's left, that's what you're going to have forever and ever. But he also said to me, when you stand before me, the length of the line behind you, of all the people that are there in heaven because of something you did in my name, something you said, some track you gave, some book you wrote that they read and got saved, whatever you did in my name, and they're here because of this, the longer the line, the more valuable you were to me. The shorter the line, the less value you had to me while you lived on earth. And if there's no line, you were of no value to me on earth. You had no value. You were just there. And I'm happy that you're saved. I'm happy that you're my child. Welcome in, you know, welcome, welcome, welcome. But your life didn't count for anything. You didn't help anybody else. It was all about you. I don't know about you, friends, but I want a long line behind me. I want people to say, Mike, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. If you didn't pass out that track, if you didn't write that book, if you didn't come to church, church and preach that message, if you didn't go to the Philippines, I wouldn't be here. That's what I want to hear. And then I want to turn back to the Lord and I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I pray the same for you. Ask yourself today, ask yourself today, if I was to die today 
and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged for the life I've lived, would there be anybody behind me to clap and to salute and say thank you for your presence in my life? Would there be anybody in your line? Because the longer the line, the more valuable you were to God Almighty. Yes. And I want to be sure that you can be as valuable as possible for him. So while every head is bowed, every eye is closed out there in the internet land, I'm talking to you too. You can be sitting there watching this wherever you may be. If you are not right with God, if you know you've been drifting, drifting, by the way, is a very slow process. And when you're drifting, you don't even know you're drifting. It's so imperceivable, okay? If you are not on fire for the Lord the way you once were, you're in trouble. You're in trouble, all right? There's too many reasons to give up in the world in which we live. There's too many reasons to be offended. Everybody's offended about something around here anymore, okay? There's too many reasons to quit and give up. And if you're, if you're cruising on fumes from yesterday's excitement for Jesus, but today it's like, yeah, maybe I'll go to church, yeah, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll read my Bible today, yeah, maybe I won't. You're in trouble. You are a disaster waiting to happen. So if that's you, I'm talking to you. And if you're here today as a good person, even though you may be in church, good for you, but church attendance is not salvation. You could be Catholic, Protestant, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Word of faith, you can be all kinds of things and be dead in your sins and go straight to hell. Okay? You need to accept Jesus, and that is something only you can do for yourself. I can't do it. Pastor Ray can't do it. The guy on TV can't do it. You have to do it for yourself. He stands at the door to your heart and knocks, but you have to open the door. So at the count of three, while everyone's here, you know the life you're living. You can't fool God. You can fool people. The Pharisees were good at doing that. Okay, they looked great, but they were full of dead men's bones, is what Jesus called them. All right? You know what you're looking at on your computer. You know what you're thinking. You know what you're spending your money on. You know, and God does too. So don't, you know, be, be honest with yourself. You're not fooling anybody except you. So be honest. And you say, oh, I'm not right with God. Well, then at the count of three, when I use three, put your hand up and say, it's me. And then we'll all stand together, everybody. You won't, I won't embarrass you. I won't have everybody stare at you, so don't get nervous. But please be honest with your life the way it presently is because God knows what's going on. You don't fool him. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's in your heart. He knows everything. So, you know, why don't you just come clean? Walk out of here with a clean slate. And wherever you are on the Internet, do the same. At the count of three. It's not a feeling, friends. It's a decision. You are deciding, I'm done with the devil, I'm done with my flesh, I'm done with all of this, I'm going to serve the Lord. Period. That's the decision you're making today. At the count of three, put your hand up if I'm talking to you. One, two, three. Hands up if I'm talking to you. Thank you. One, two, three. Thank you. Four, thank you. Five, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Six, thank you. Seven, thank you. Eight, praise the Lord. Praise God. Anybody else? Be bold about it. Don't hope I don't see your hand. Let the devil see it. Remember, that's what you're going to use to slap him around. Thank you, Father. Let's all stand. Let's make a declaration of intent together. Okay? This is not a prayer of salvation. You're not asking the Lord for something. He died. It's done. The sins have been paid for. Now you just accept the gift. You're not asking for something. We, we call it a prayer of salvation. It's not. It's a declaration of intent. I am choosing to serve Jesus. Period. And devil, stand there and listen. Because there's nothing you can do about it. Because it's my free will and it's my choice. So let's say this out loud together. Everybody in the building up in the balcony area, down on the ground floor, even the people out there in internet land, wherever you may be, you say it too, because God's right there with you too, out loud. And remember, like I said, let the people on the second floor hear you, okay? Don't be whispering, hope nobody hears you. Let the devil hear you. Let your neighbors hear you. Don't be shy about it. Don't be embarrassed to serve Jesus. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So let's say it like we mean it. Okay, if they can shout at basketball games, shout at football games, how much more can we declare who we serve here today? 
Amen. Let's do this together. All right? All right, here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, come to you today, I come to you today, and I believe, I believe that you are the Christ, the, Christ the, Son God, the Son of God, that you died on the cross, on the cross and paid for my sins. For my sins. So, today, so today, I make my choice. And for the rest of my life, I serve you and you alone. I am sorry for all my sins. But right now, I receive total forgiveness. And I am never, never, never looking back. I am clean. I am forgiven. And I am on my way to heaven. Thank you, Lord for loving me, dying for me, and believing in me. Amen. Now let's clap and thank God, because that's something we can clap about. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. A couple things before you make your way home. Don't run out the door. The cafeteria will remain open for you. Hold your horses for just a minute. If today's message was a blessing to you, we brought two books. I've written 10 books. I'm, written number, I'm writing number 11 now. But these two, I asked the Lord, he said, bring these because of what I'm going to tell you to share. So one of them's called Hope, the power to believe until you receive. you got to have hope. Hope's called a helmet for your head. It's where most people do their thinking. I've met a few I'm not so sure about, but praise the Lord. And then this one, if today's message rang your bell, be strong, stay strong. Get there, stay there for the rest of your life. First book I wrote. And then this is a fundraiser for our crusades in the Philippines. This is the uniform they wear when they go to the Philippines and preach for us. A couple from the church have gone over the years. This one is the new one that we're using this year called Entrusted. So if, that, if you're into Christian t-shirts, and I've never met a Christian that isn't, and on the back there is the uh, verse, you know, not, uh, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. Amen. So if that's something that, we'll, if you like shirts and want to help us hold crusades, these are the uniforms they wear. This is a fundraiser. You can help us there too. Did this help anybody today? Yes. Praise God. Amen. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Errol. Amen. Thank you again, Pastor Mike. That was awesome. It was a real eye-opener. Yes, so we truly love you. Mark. Yes, we truly love you. And uh, at this time, we're going to collect a, a love offering. You can also text to give. You could also give online. So give our Pastor Mike, good friend of the church, another big round of applause. Amen. Now, now as we are standing, I will dismiss. Father God, we thank you for this word this morning. Father God, we thank you that you have encouraged us, that you have blessed us, that you have entrusted us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Father God, let us move forward with the greatest spirit of boldness and purpose, purposing to live and walk the seven priorities of life so that we might better serve you, that we might touch the lost and dying world, that we might be a light, the one who might have hope. We know, Lord, that one can chase a thousand, two can chase 10,000, oh Lord. So Lord, let us be that person that makes a difference for your kingdom. So, Father God, as we leave this place, but never your presence, let the grace, power, and God rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, for always, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, honor, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Till we all meet again, let us all give God the glory and thanks, and we ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.